Hey, nerdy knitters. Welcome to another episode of the Nerdy Knitting Podcast, where we like to get a little bit nerdy with our knitting. So grab your favorite beverage and your knitting and let's settle in. Anything we discuss, you'll find linked down in the video description box below the video. We'll start with our knitting news. The first thing that I saw was on Instagram. The first time I saw it was on Instagram. Then I saw it pop up in lots of different groups on Facebook and in different places. Marie Antoinette's Knitting Needles. When I first saw these, I saw them on Lucy Worsley's Instagram page. Lucy Worsley is a historian from the UK and she is the host of many different documentary series. So on her Instagram page, she posted what are supposed to be Marie Antoinette's Knitting Needles. So I'll put a picture here of the Knitting Needles now. I'm not so sure these are really her Knitting Needles. I don't know historically when Knitting Needles started to get larger. For quite a long time, they were really thin wire and very, I mean, the yarn was lace weight yarn. So these knitting needles look quite large compared to what you would use for lace weight yarn. So I don't know, we'd have to make a guess about if that is actually her knitting needles or not, but maybe somebody with a little more knowledge about knitting history would know. Now, the second interesting thing I saw is sort of like a little DIY trick. If you like to have your cakes of yarn in a yarn cozy to keep them corralled, then a great way to do that is with the leg of a tube sock. Somebody posted on Facebook that when their husband's socks would start to wear out, they would cut off the foot and then use the long leg of the sock as a yarn cozy. I thought that was just a really neat way to reuse something that would otherwise probably just end up in the trash. Last bit of news is the Craft Yarn Council. They're hosting their Great Yarn Challenge starting in February and running through till March. It's a virtual based competition with weekly challenges and prizes, things like spruce up your space and stitch it forward. And if it's something that would be interesting to you, registration's now open for that. Each week I like to discuss your knitting questions and we had three questions submitted last week that I thought we would address today. And if you have a question that you'd like to have answered, if you go to the community tab on the Nerdy Knitting YouTube page, every Saturday I post a picture and then ask for your questions and that's where I will go and gather the questions that are left when I record the next episode of the podcast. So if you have questions you'd like to have answered on the podcast, you can go over to the community tab and leave your questions there. The first question is from Carmen. She wants to know how shawls on the bias work. We've done a few different series here on the Nerdy Knitting channel about different shawl shapes with triangle shawls and the different ways you can knit those. And then we talked about the different half circle and crescent shaped shawls. And I do have a series coming up where we'll discuss rectangular shawls and bias shawls fall in that category. There's two different ways you can knit a bias rectangular shawl. Now the first way would be to cast on for the full width of your shawl, however wide you'd like it to be. And then on every other row, you would decrease at one edge and increase at the other. Or reverse it, you would increase at one and decrease at the other, it doesn't really matter. But you would continue that for the length of the shawl. Now the stitch count won't change, but by it working an increase at one end and a decrease at the other, it creates a bias shape where the stitches seem to be running off at a diagonal instead of straight up and down. And one of my current projects actually has this formula. So let me put my coffee down and I'll show you what that looks like. So I'll talk more about this project later when I'm talking about my projects, but for now, I just wanna show you the shaping. It's not blocked or anything, so it's still a bit wonky looking. So if you look at the central double decrease lines that run right along the shawl, you can see they don't go straight up and down following each edge. They are running on a diagonal line. So this shawl shape is created by working a decrease on one edge and then working an increase on the other edge. So that doesn't change the stitch count, but it gives the shawl a bias effect where the stitches aren't running parallel to the edges. They're sort of going off on a diagonal. Now that's the first way to get a bias shape for a shawl and it's probably the easiest because you're just casting on all of your stitches right away. But another way to get that bias shape is by starting at one point and increasing at both edges, sort of like the heirloom grandma's favorite dishcloth. But instead of when it's as wide as you want, you start decreasing. When it's as wide as you want, then you start doing that same bias shaping where you increase on one edge and decrease on the other. And you continue that for the length that you want. And then you start decreasing on both edges. This little throw right here was knit using that method. So it started at one point, just like grandma's favorite dishcloth, you increase until it's as wide as you want. Now, instead of starting to decrease, that's when I just continued decreasing along one edge and increasing along the other until it was as long as I wanted it to be. And then I started decreasing both edges 
to get the other point. Another example of this would be the clapotis shawl on Knitty. It's a free pattern, so you can go look at that and get a really good idea of how a, a bias shawl is knit. Now, the next question is from Wendy, and she wanted some tips for de-stashing her yarn. I am not the best person to answer this question because I don't have a big stash of yarn. I don't buy yarn to buy yarn. Sometimes I think it's a separate hobby for some people, buying yarn and actually knitting the yarn. I'm not one of those people. Usually when I... I plan a new project is when I buy the yarn, with the exception of sock yarn and dishcloth yarn. If I'm ordering from Knit Picks and I know I want to spend a certain amount to get free shipping or something, I might toss in a few skeins of stroll fingering yarn because I know that I'll always use yarn for knitting socks or the same with their dishy dishcloth yarn. But I do have a few general tips. I think the first thing I would do is decide why I want to de-stash and what goals I could achieve depending on that why. Is it because I just have way too much yarn and I need to use it. Do I need to cut down on my spending? Am I feeling guilty for all of my purchases? Depending on why you want to de-stash, that can affect how you should do it. Now, if you want to just like clear out your yarn, I would pull it all out and lay it out and make a plan like what yarn am I actually going to knit with and divide that from the rest of the yarn. And then with that yarn that you plan to not use, you can trade it with other knitters or I'll list it on Ravelry and sell it give it as gifts and then the yarn that you're keeping make a plan for it don't just stick it back up in a cubby hole or something make a plan for how you're actually going to use that yarn and there are lots of stash busting groups on facebook and ravelry where you can get lots of tips or support from other people who are trying to de-stash as well and i think it really depends on your goal why you want to clear out your stash and once you understand why you can make a plan for how to do that that really fits your needs and the last question was from Courtney who wants to know about building her knitting skills. How do I build my knitting skills? I can knit, purl, decrease, work flat in the round. Seeing all of the potential skills to learn in the future creates some information overwhelm. What skills should I try to learn next? How do I create an action plan for additional skills to prioritize learning? I have a goal of learning how to make socks and sweaters. The easiest thing to do would be to pick a project that includes the skills that you'd like to learn and then just start. If you have a goal of knitting socks and sweaters, then start knitting socks and sweaters. Uh, somebody recently left a comment that I thought was really interesting and I had not thought of it that way, but learning to knit a sock actually includes lots of great skills. You're knitting in the round. If you're doing the heel flop and gusset, you're learning how to slip stitches, um, how to pick up stitches along the edge, how to work decreases for the gusset shaping, how to graft the toe. All of those are skills that you can use for other projects as well. So my first bit of advice would just to be to pick the thing that you want to work on, whether it's a certain technique like brioche or whether it's a certain shape or a garment type. If you want a little more hand holding than just buying a pattern and jumping in, then there's lots of classes online through, through Craftsy or other online marketplaces and virtual events. Um, the Knitting Guild Association has some small mini courses, anything like that that will help you improve your technique. So this is a great way to combine the two. Like you could pick a project, like say you wanna learn fair isle knitting, then you could go to Craftsy and see what kind of fair isle projects are there. And you can actually work through a project and gain the skills at the same time. And I would also recommend buying knitting books. I think, well, of course you can use YouTube and online and things like that, but having a few technique books or skill-based books in your knitting library is a good thing because then you always have them on hand to refer to. And if you really wanna get serious about your knitting skills, the Master Hand Knitting Program or the Professional Hand Knitting Program through the Knitting Guild Association are both serious programs that will really help you improve your knitting. They're not for everybody. You really have to have a certain desire to complete something like that, but they are a great resource for those people who want to complete something like that. But they're certainly not necessary to become a really good knitter. I just think you should start choosing projects that will help you achieve the goals that you want to, and then take it one technique and one step and one skill at a time. Before we look at what I've been knitting, I just wanna share about this week's sponsor, which is Craftsy. Crafty is a great platform for learning all different skills, knitting, quilting, drawing, painting, so many different things that you can learn on Crafty. They've got great video courses, some for specific techniques, or if you like to do knitting projects, you'll find lots of patterns on there with tutorials to walk you through them. I used a few of their classes to really work on honing my fair isle techniques and I really loved doing them and they were a really great way to practice those skills and also have some pretty projects when I was finished. And right now they're having their $3 membership sale. I think it's actually $2.97 or something like that. 
but if you're cur if you're watching this video when it comes out then they're having that sale and of the link down below you can click through and you can get a year-long membership which is something i think more like eighty dollars for just three dollars and you'll have access to all of the videos and all of the classes on there so for the past few weeks i have been talking about this shawl the color adventure shawl not sure if that's the final name but that's what it is right now and i had finished it i had created a ruffle on the edge and wasn't quite sure if I liked it. I asked your opinion last week and the majority of people said no to the ruffle and I agreed after really laying it out and looking at it and spending some time with it. I enjoy a good ruffle but it just wasn't working with this design so I took out the ruffle and I refinished the edge and instead it's going to be finished with a pico edge which for some reason it had slipped my mind that I couldn't I thought I would need a specific stitch count, which I was trying to avoid because this was supposed to be meant for any long color change yarn. So whenever the color changes, you would switch to another color until you get to this last section where it, you'll need like about a hundred gram skein for the, the gray or for whatever yarn you're using. Um, but I didn't want it to have a specific stitch count because it could change depending on what somebody's using for yarn. So, but it worked out in the end. I, I had forgotten that with a Pico bind off, as long as with a certain, the way I was doing it, um, as long as you had an odd number of stitches, which a top down, which with this top down triangle shawl, you will, then as long as you had that odd number, then you could do this Pico bind off. So I think it looks better than the ruffle did. So it's got a little eyelet ridge and then a few rows of garter and then that pico bind off and what's interesting about this is just the, that pico edge just this section right here I can't remember how many rows I had done before with the ruffle but doing the pico bind off took just as much yarn so I, I thought the ruffle would take more yarn but I still had the same same amount of tail left so the pico edge takes just as much it just looks a little bit different so I, I like how that one looks so I've got to get this blocked and get the ends woven in and get the pattern written up and that will be coming out soon. And I have another skein of yarn from this yarn company. This is Gage Dye Works. It's their whiskey in a teacup. This is on their uh, Merino Cashmere Nylon Fingering Base. I have another skein from them, the same color. So I'm going to start this same shawl idea. It's the same sort of uh, long color change that's meant to be worked with sort of a triangle shawl, but I'm going to do an asymmetrical triangle, but with the same sort of patterning like this, just a different shape. So I'm hoping to have a whole series of these color adventure shawls. So we've got the top down triangle and the next one will be the asymmetrical triangle. And the prototype was actually a bias arrow shape shawl, but this particular yarn didn't work for that design because you need to cast on for the full width and these beginning sections, of course, they use just a small amount of that little color because it me it's meant to be used with a pattern where you start with just a few stitches and then you increase and increase. So it didn't work with that shape. So I have to think about what to do for that. But I think a whole series of shawls with this cha changing the stitch patterns when you get to a different color is really fun. And very simple stitch patterns, but just sort of fun fun thing to do. And my final project for the Master Hand Knitting program is coming along very well. I'm in that space on Sleeve Island where I'm feeling like things are never going to end, but it is getting there. There's one sleeve. I'm doing them two at a time. Just hoping to help make things go easier. I'm using uh, the Bear Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Worsted. And it's a nice yarn, great for something like this. And I'm on my last section of increases. I was increasing every other right side row. Now I'm increasing every sixth row and I have one, two, three, four, five. I have three more increases to go. So we are closing in. So that's what, about 18 more rows. And then I will be binding off both sides of each of these and just keeping this middle cable motif. And that will be the part that runs along the saddle shoulder. So we're closing in. Hopefully I will have that done by next week. And then we can start seaming the sweater up. I'm getting a little tired of the sweater. So I do a few rows and then I have to stop because I don't know if you, when you get tired of a project, if you're 
your tension starts to change or if it just gets a little sloppy but I'm trying to be careful because this is that final project and I certainly don't want to have it come back saying that I have to redo the whole sweater because it's a lot of work so if I feel like I'm not doing my best work I try to take a break and work on other things but I'm at that place where I just I'd like to be done and just get it sent off I've been working on this since the whole program since 2018 so I would like to be finished and I'm not sure if I should tackle something else next this has taken up so much of my my knitting thought and time but I mean it's been worth it it's been really good I've learned so much about knitting through this program but I'm kind of getting tired of that sweater <laughs> so I'll be glad to have that finished so the last thing I'm working on right now is that shawl I showed you earlier that bias shawl where it's sort of running in this direction but the lines of the knitting are running in the other direction so it's got that bias pattern going on it's really fun it is garter stitch which usually isn't my favorite but there's so much going on in the pattern that it really stays interesting and the lace gives it a break from that garter stitch feel and you've got all of the increases and decreases going on to get that shaping in the chevron like design i'm using earth yarns merino gradient set which is four different colors here see if i can get them all up there so <laughs> So I started with the palest blue, this one right here. And then I introduced this sort of a speckly. It's mostly pale blue and then it has some speckles of the darker blue. And then I'll move into this one, which is more of a 50-50 a split between the two colors. And then it moves into this really beautiful cobalt blue. So the plan is I divided the other three colors in half so I had about 25 grams in each of these little cakes I kept this one the way it is because I'm going to I started with that color and then moving to this one and then this one then I'm going to move to this one and then I'll go back the other way and work my way back through those colors on the other side so I've been cast on and I finished the first the first color this lightest blue and I'm working on and I faded in, I sort of like, um, I would work, when I was ready to introduce this color, let me see if I can find where it is. It's actually very hard to see because <laughs> the colors are so similar. But I think right about here, yeah, right about there is where I started fading this one in. So I would add two rows of this and then do four rows of the lightest blue and then another two rows of this and then two rows of the other one and two rows of this and then two rows of that one and then then I think I switched to four rows of this and then two rows of the lighter blue until I was finished with the lightest blue and then I just was started using this and I finished almost finished using all of this I still have about half a repeat to go and then I'll introduce the next color which is the speckly not the speckled more of a half and half between the two colors and then repeat that same process again until I get to the cobalt blue and then reverse things. So there's a lot going on because the stitch pattern, there are no sort of rest rows, which is good because with lace, sometimes I find if like you just have a row where you just knit the wrong side row or purl the wrong side row. If you've messed something up, you won't see it until two rows later. But with the no rest rows, you can automatically see if you missed something or made a mistake, especially with the, the central double decreases because they're at particular locations. You can always use those to tell where you are and if you've messed something up because they should always line up. And if they don't, or if you missed a stitch somewhere or missed a yarn over, then you can fix it right away. What was really interesting about this is usually when I have like a lace pattern or something like this, I prefer to use a chart. I just find it easier to visualize. But for some reason I got about, I think about six rows in, and I had made three or four mistakes already at that point. And I was just so frustrated. My stitch count was off for like the third time and I couldn't tell what I was doing wrong. So I just ripped it all out and I started again following the written instructions and it's just been a breeze once I got the pattern in my head and I really got the rhythm of what was going on. But for some reason, the, the chart usually, which is what I would use normally, just wasn't working for me for this pattern, but the written instructions are just perfect. So it's coming along nicely. I did change 
the pattern slightly, just um, the stitch count. Like she's very generous. She tells you exactly like how many uh, multiple or what the multiple is if you want to change things. So um, because let me see, she has a scarf and a wrap. I don't even say what this pattern was. This is the Adventurer Wrap and Scarf from Amba O'Brien. Goodness. Um, but it comes with two different sizes. The scarf, which I think was 10 inches wide by 85 inches long. And then the wrap, which I think was 18 inches wide by 85 inches long. I didn't want it quite so long. I didn't have enough for the wrap size. I have enough for the scarf, but I didn't want it quite as long and I wanted it a little wider. So I, I, I changed the stitch count slightly. So it's a little wider than 10 inches. I think it's closer to 12. I didn't, I didn't measure it. Um, but I didn't swatch for this one. For a scarf, eh, I don't really need, care about my gauge being exact to hers. But after I did um, a full repeat of the pattern, I weighed my yarn to see how much yarn that section had taken and that gave me a rough estimate of where I should start my fading before I would run out of yarn. I want to, I, I like to be thrifty and use as much of my yarn as possible without having too many leftovers. So I sat down and did some quick calculations and had my husband check my math for me. He's the math whiz in this house. And so I could sort out when to start the fading. So both edges are sort of even. I don't want to like end up with like a long faded section in one side, but then I run out of yarn for the other and I've got to sort of cram it all together. I wanted it to be as even as possible. So it's coming along nicely and it's sort of addictive. Like you sit down, you knit, and I'm already almost finished with my second color. So the first section of my second color. So it's coming along nicely. Now this week's knitting resource is one of my favorites, the Vogue Knitting Ultimate Reference. <laughs> I'm not even sure of the title. The Ultimate Knitting Book. Now this is a really, really great reference book, especially if you're a visual person. I know last week I talked about the principles of knitting, which is a great book for intermediate to more advanced knitters who really want a textbook, word heavy, lots of descriptive technical things. But sometimes you want a quick reference, you want some pictures. I'm very visual. So when I need to look up something quickly, this is usually the book I grab first because I really like the visuals and the quick explanations. If I want more detailed explanations, this is not my first choice. But for something quick, this is great. And it's also good for beginners because it really covers the basics very well. The whole first section is just on knitting needle type, yarn materials, the weights of yarn, all of the basic things. And then the first few chapters are just very simple. It has like how to work the knit stitch, how to do the purl stitch, all of the basic stitch patterns, all the different ways to cast on and bind off and increase and decrease. You'll find them all in here. And then sections for more advanced techniques. You've got lace and cables, all the ways to do color works, and then more advanced techniques like brioche. None of the things are covered in a lot of depth. Like you're only going to find about a, a handful of pages about brioche where like you could have a whole book dedicated to the one topic. So you're not going to find as much information. It's sort of a highlight of that technique. So you can see I use it a lot. I've even got my pages marked here on the side so I can quickly look things up. So it's a quick reference. If you really want to dive deep on a topic, you're going to want to find another book like well for brioche as as an example i would look here just as a quick reference but if i really wanted to dive into brioche i would buy one book just about brioche to really understand the technique and there are another couple sections in this book that i really like they have a section on instructions and errors and proper finishing techniques which i think is something you need to think about before you even cast on a project like if you want your cast on and bind off to match, you have to think about that before you even cast on so you can choose the right cast on for your project. Things like that can really level up your knitting. And then they have a great section on designing, designing sweaters and then shawls and then even a section on smaller accessories like socks and hats and mittens. Um, it's a nice big section. Probably half the book is just about those designing topics. So if it's something, even if you don't plan to publish des knitting patterns, but you want to design and knit something for yourself, then the information in, in here is a really great place to start. So I think this is a great all-around book for visual people, for people who just want 
something quick to reference, I would have this book on your shelf, the Vogue Knitting Ultimate Knitting Book. Now, before we wrap up, I just want to give an update on the Fixing Your Knitting Mistakes course, which will be coming up very soon. My goal is to have like the prerequisite how to read your stitches, how to read your increases and decreases, um, have those filmed next week. And then the week after that, I'm going to start on the first few videos for the actual course. And then we'll have sort of a, an open class or open, open cart, I guess, um, when people can join this first group where it's not going to be a full course right away. It's going to be sort of incremental so I can get some feedback on how to proceed, what should be the next step after you learn how to fix a dropped stitch or something like that. So if you'd like to learn more about that, you can join the waiting list. You'll find a link for my email list down below. They'll be notified first because I'll be open, opening up the course to them first. And this first group is really going to help me create the course and develop it into what would be useful to most knitters. I really need your feedback. So if you'd be interested in that, then you can go join that email list. So hopefully we'll be ready to open that cart in mid-February. So that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for joining me today. And I hope to see you back here next week when we have another podcast. And if you're new here and you'd like to catch up on past episode, you'll find a playlist right here and I'll see you in that next video.